So it is recording, so I think we're good to go, Sensor Benson. Sounds great. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to week three of our second uh, umbrella of interviews for Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. Um, I'm super excited about this week. Every week, it feels to me like we're growing and, and to be honest, getting more to the chat aspect. We all know how to punch, kick, and choke, um, but the hanging out, shooting the shit, that's really something that we've been aiming for. And uh, we've seen it in all of you logging in week after week. Uh, we have more registrations this week than ever yet, and we're super excited about that. Um, we'll talk later about the pause we'll take before we come back with three more guests, but I'm just so excited and honored to be a part of this like every week. So I'm going to start off by introducing, as I do every week, um, Sensei Nicholas Suino. So he is one of our, our interviewers, our chatters. He was our first ever guest on the show. He launched this ship with us. Uh, he is an eighth Dan in uh, Iaido. He is a sixth Dan in Judo, a fifth Dan in Japanese Jiu Jitsu, which is, is highly relevant for tonight for our guest. Uh, he's just an incredible martial artist. He runs the Japanese Martial Arts Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and he's a teacher and a friend. Sensei Suino, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, Sean. Uh, and once again, you've proved uh, one of my many sayings, which is um, if you learn how to introduce people properly, you'll never lack for invitations. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> I cannot uh, do justice to uh, Randy Dauphin quite the way um, uh, you did for me, but um, I will, and since we've done a few of these, the folks that have joined us have heard me talk about Randy in glowing terms. Uh, I just want to tell you uh, a story of last year in 2019, we went to Tokyo together and trained in a number of dojos. And so our days were, you know, get up, get to Starbucks, uh, hit Tokyo, get some lunch, hit Tokyo, buy swords, uh, you know, buy judo keys, buy karate keys, and then go to a dojo and train, 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 drink some beer, eat some sushi, get, uh, go to bed, um, and do it all again the next day. And we did that about 10 days running, came back and collapsed. Um, but um, Randy was so game. Uh, I'm kind of crazy when I get to Tokyo. I like to go full speed, 24-7. And we walked all over that town. We tra trained all over that town. Um, and, um, you know, as you know, Randy's very accomplished and in martial arts, but not only did he go to places that were somewhat familiar, but he also went to dojos and did martial arts that were completely unfamiliar, always maintaining a great attitude, a can-do spirit, um, and just a great travel companion. So if you ever get an opportunity to go overseas or on any training junkets, uh, I, I know somebody you should pick. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Sensei Randy Dauphin. Yeah, and if you pick me to go with you, you better be sure that you're higher ranking with me and you can keep, and you can keep me in line because I've, I've only been to Japan with two people. That's with uh, Sensei Suino and Sensei Legacy. And lucky for everybody in Japan that those guys could keep me in line while I was there. So um, thanks so much for that, Sensei Suino. Um, you, I'm, I always get the honor of introducing the Hanshis. I, I'm the one who gets to introduce the highest ranking people. But uh, you can see... If you're looking, you can see we have Grandmaster Bill, Bill Wallace is uh, on the call tonight, surprising to all of us. Uh, I mean, I could give uh, an hour long introduction to Bill Superfoot Wallace, but honestly, like if you don't know who he is, you should just sign off of this call now and I don't know, go do something bad to yourself because... Uh, <laughs> That's it, Bill Wallace is a legend, uh, a legend, uh, like a personal hero of mine coming up. And it's so exciting to, to see him here. And thanks to Anchi John Terry and for getting him to, to be here with us. But uh, I want to introduce first my, my sensei, my karate teacher, um, Anchi Gary Legacy, uh, a pioneer in Canadian martial arts, a uh, member of the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame, has been a student of some of the best, uh, best, best uh, karate teachers in, in Canada and international. Uh, he's trained with Richard Kim. He's trained with Benny Allen. He currently is a student of Sensei Anthony Sandoval. Um, when we had him on, uh, it was so well received when he did this interview in this chat. Uh, and we're going to have him back on again. There's... I, again, I could go on and on again about Hanchi Legacy. Uh, if you know me and you know Hanchi Legacy, you know he's like a father to me. Uh, I love the guy. There's nothing I wouldn't do for him. Um, he's given me a different type of life than I could have had without him. So I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, 
But tonight, the, the man of the hour, or the man of the hour and the half, <laughs> is uh, Hanshi John Terrian. Um, Hanshi John Terrian, he is a ninth degree black belt. He, by the PKA, voted him the man of the decade. Uh, he's the owner of Terrian Jiu Jitsu and Kickboxing, which is a franchise of uh, martial arts schools uh, here in Canada. Um, he's a organizer par excellence. He, he runs uh, the most massive and well-run uh, martial arts event, I think anywhere in the world, which is Capital Conquest. Um, he's, uh, he also runs the World Martial Arts Convention, which happened in Vienna. Uh, he's the president of the World Kabuto Federation. Um, not about him, but you know, also about him. He is the manager of the 23-time uh, world kickboxing champion, John Yves Terrio, which is something to note. Um, he himself is also a member of the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. He and Sensei Legacy are both in the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. Um, so those are a bunch of his accolades. Um, and I know I missed some. Like when I was talking to him the other day, I think uh, it's over 500 types of awards he's received mm -hmm. um, in his martial arts career. <laughs> which spans over 60 years. And he's a, a founding, founding father of martial arts here in, in Canada and actually just in North America. Um, so I haven't known Hanchi Terrian for a long time. I have known of him for a long time, but I think we actually started talking to each other maybe about a year and a half ago uh, when Hanchi Legacy was being in, inducted into the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. Um, I can tell you, I personally enjoyed my very first interaction with him in every interaction that I've had with him since. Um, there's that one thing, you know, that you can tell a lot about a person by the company that they keep. Uh, Hanchi, Hanchi John Darian keeps the best of company. <laughs> the company that he keeps is the best of company. He socializes uh, and is good friends with people like Hanchi Cesar Burkowski, again, Sensei Jean Yves Terrio, uh, Hanchi Alan Saleh, uh, Sensei Wally Sloki. When I was there in, in Gatineau, you know, everybody, he, he has Sensei Bill Wallace around him, Steve Nassi Anderson, Joe Corley was there with him. It's just, he, ha he keeps the best company. Um, for me personally, he helped me the first time I met him, the very first time I met him, you might not know this, but he helped me fulfill a dream. Uh, you know, Jean Yves Terrio, when I was young, he was the person that I always looked up to. And uh, he, he and Sensei Legacy pulled me into the ring with him after he had fought. And I, got to, I get to say that thanks to Hunchy uh, Jean Terrio, and I got to stand in a, a ring with the 23-time the world kickboxing champion, Jean Yves Terrio. Um, Outside of that, the things that, that come to my mind immediately when I think of uh, Hanchi Terrian is extremely on honest, an extremely honest person, a very genuine person. To me, just a very brave person, intelligent, wise, skilled. And the one word that really comes to mind for me is, and I've told him this, for a person who's so skilled and so high level and flies in such high circles, he is so accessible to everybody. He is so accessible to everyone. When you're at Capital Conquest and there's no, there's no big screen around him, there's no, you can just walk up to him and talk to him and, and he's happy to use his knowledge and his wisdom and his skill to help you in any way. And that for me, that's the way I see uh, Hanchi John Terrian and that's my introduction to, uh, to our show tonight. Thanks, Sensei Dauphin. So really quickly to the people watching, uh, first off, as I say every week, if you got people under 18, we might be swearing, we might tell some off-color stories. It's punch, kick, choke, chat with a bunch of people who are over 18. So if that's an issue for you, you can plug your ears or call your Sensei and complain. To that end, I got some allergies going today. I haven't started doing cocaine again, if you catch me sniffling a little too much. Um, it's kicking up in the air right now. And also to the people watching, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> to the people watching, uh, we want your questions. You'll see there's a chat button on the bottom of your screen. So, you know, we've been doing this weekly. We're, we're in a bit of a groove and we're really happy with it. 
but the groove doesn't work without you and your questions, which uh, Robert, who runs our show technically and is just a fantastic martial artist and person in his own right, he'll, he'll forward us the questions that aren't utter shite and then we'll ask them of our guest each week. So please send those our way. Sensei Tarian, how, you, you've won so many awards, you've got all these accolades, but how does it feel to hear that introduction and all that genuine praise from someone who's so appreciative of, of who you are in this community? Well, first of all, I, I'm not one to speak about myself. So when I get accolades like that, I feel a little awkward because I'm not, uh, I'm used to hearing good things if you want to, but I don't uh, stop on there. It's more important for me to speak about everybody else than to speak about me. But it makes me reflect on a lot of things. Like when he, when uh, Sensei Randy mentioned the uh, PKA man of the decade, you know, that's going back to the 80s and stuff. And it was a big award and it's one of the top five or six I've received. There's a little bit of a flashback there because Joe Corley, who was really somebody I looked up to as an entrepreneur, as a, as a promoter, as, as an admin guy, and we let him make all the mistakes, like he fought Bill Wallace twice, that was twice he made a mistake, you know? So, but I look at that and, and I say, wow, we came a long way with all of that, we, in that sport. So, um, and I never started to say, well, I'm going to do my best to win an award. I do my best because I have to do my best. If you are my student, I have to teach you and make you the very best. Not make me the teacher, not make me the very best, but for my students. And, and if you can put that together in all the awards, I think that when I listen to all of that, it, it brings memories. And memories, when you reach a certain age, they're very nice to have. And it's nice when I wake up in the morning and I have my cup of coffee and I'm sitting on the balcony of the Congo and we have a beautiful view of the river and the trees and it's quiet. And I go back and I have flashback of certain things. And uh, that to me is great to hear the awards, not so great for what I did and to applaud myself. It's the memories, it's the good times, the hard times, and God knows the funny times that we have. We had lots of those. I, I hear that and I really appreciate that. Um, so let, let's dive right into those memories. So you're a kid in Ottawa. What brings you into your first ever martial arts school? What scared you? What kept you there? And uh, just tell us about that early experience. What brought you there and, and what kept you there? I was about 12 years old, and I'm from Lower Town in Ottawa, which is predominantly French Canadians, uh, low income. I come from a family of six children, mom and dad, very, very good parents, but not rich. And I go to the French school, and the English school is huge, and they have a gym, and they have uh, gymnastics and all kinds of stuff. So I go there, and I do... Uh, floor mat, I do a little bit of everything, trampoline and whatnot. I'm 12 years old, but there's two guys, and I think they were green belt or something, and they're teaching judo. And they have like two or three students. And I was fascinated, and I kept looking at it. And then after three weeks or so, they said, hey, kid, want to join in? Uh, scared a little bit, so I went in because I saw them do break falls and tumble, and, which I was able to do because of gymnastics. So I did that and I trained, uh, I don't know, six months with them and they gave me a yellow belt, but they were green belt. They gave me a yellow belt. <laughs> and, then, uh, and this is like 1961, 62. So, um, and I go back and one day I get there, they're gone. Don't know them, don't know their names. They're just gone. And, and so I went back to gymnastics. And then as time moved on, I tried a little bit about a year or so later, I tried amateur boxing and um, I did the training, never got a fight, but I enjoyed that. And then that stopped. And one day, because all my friends at that time were learning karate and they were loving it. And for some reason, there was a little sign in the karate school that was about eight and a half, 11, and it says jujitsu. And I had read a little bit of a book. There was not too many books then. I think it was by Bruce Tegner. 
you know? So I look at the book and I go, wow, I'm gonna try that. So I call. Now, George Sylvain was my teacher. George Sylvain was a police officer. And he stands about six, six feet, six one. In shape, he weighed like 230, 225. Big guy, big voice, you know? So I called for the information. He go, hello. You know, in those days, people were not so modest to answer the phone. Our skills to run the martial arts schools were not quite the same. So he says, well, come and see what it's like. Now, I'm about 14, I think. So I go up the stairs, and it's a third floor. It's L'Angelier Karate School. Uh, uh, Angie Legacy will remember L'Angelier Karate School. Bill Wallace fought at the Canadian Open by promoted by Andre L'Angelier in the 70s. Like it's, it's a big deal. But you walk up the stairs and there's one light bulb and the stairs are squeaking. You go up and then the second floor, then the third floor. And I look out to the side to see the office and you go, yeah, what do you want? I said, oh man, I almost turned around. <laughs> <laughs> It's like Angie Legacy did when he walked into the dojo, right? <laughs> I was scared and, and I had clean underwear, so that was not so bad, you know? So I walked in and, uh, and he said, who are you? So I gave my name and he said, uh, okay, you can start uh, whatever next week, Monday, Wednesday. And the price was heavy. You got to remember, it was $25 for three months. $25 for three yeah. months. So I get to the first class and he's got like a felt on the floor and like a, a blanket covering the felt. So the mat was not even a mat, okay? But it looked good and we went there. And remember, I did a bit of gymnastics so I could roll, I could do this, I could do that. But from the first class, I knew this was for me. I, I knew I was going to keep training. I didn't know I was going to teach. I didn't know I was going to be a black belt. I kept on training and, and I liked it. And that was my hook, was, was that day, that little sign, eight by 10, in the corner of a window, downtown Ottawa, and boom. So I read that and Mr. Sylvain and I, we, we speak about that because I think that was my calling and that was my journey. And I look at all I've done since that little card. Now, if that was not there, I don't know if I would have done martial arts. But I got to rewind a little bit. I used to go watch the guys train, and there was Fern Cleru from Hull that Mr. Mm. Wallace knows very well. Tough guy, big heavyweight tough guy. George Sylvain was also in Canada, another tough guy. And then Langelier, Andre Langelier, may, may Andre Langelier and Fern Cleru rest in peace. And they were tough guys, big heavyweights. They loved to fight. That was the 60s. That's why you, you train was to fight. So, and then there was a few other guys training. And there was a guy named Mike Litwinchuk who made it to Black Belt, very nice man, who was about 10 years younger than these guys. He was like 14 years old. And when they said that Jumei and they would fight, he got, he got knocked out, not knocked out, but knocked around and stuff like that. So I, Mike is my friend, I admire him for, stat, for keeping coming, you know? So then I go to the jujitsu and everything else started to open up. And so uh, George Sylvain had been a soldier, right, in the army? And yeah, he had been a military police after the war in Germany. And he told me some dandies. He was a brown belt in judo. And he, he learned some police tactics because that was his trade. And he trained with Ron Forrester after, in the 60s. He trained with Ron Forrester in Toronto at Frank Atashta's dojo at Bank, no, at the Queen and Jarvis. And he, he was telling me, it's like when the soldiers were out uh, for a night out, all right? Like Mr. Wallace was in the Marines. He, he knows what I'm talking about. So the guys go out and they go for a drink. So the bus comes in to pick them up. The military police walks in. They got their little blackjack and they go bang, bang, bang. All right, guys, party over in the bus. Well, there's 50 of them. So 40 get in the bus. Now you got 10 left. And then you say, hey, guys, come on, let's go. So you, you hustle a little bit, and three or four gets in the bus. And the other one, you have to put them in the bus, right? So he said, you learn a lot about life. And he was a, a younger <coughs> boy. And um, so when he came back to Canada, he trained in jiu-jitsu. 
and he trained in karate. He made black belt in both martial arts and some ranks, of course. And, but to me, he was, I had two really instructors or, or what we call sensei, which is a teacher and a mentor, and I had two. Mr. Sylvain was the main one for everything physical. We would train and uh, Professor Sylvain would never open a door unless he had to. Normally he'd walk through the door. You know, he was that kind of solid and big guy and tough guy. So when we spar, later on when I was a uh, uh, brown belt and then even black belt and we would train together and the, it, it was funny. It was a big guy and his school was closed on Thursday night. Don't ask me why Thursday night, but it was closed. And when we trained, he, he had to train 10 times harder than anybody to get it right. Because nothing came easy for him. But the, the love and the drive of training was unbelievable. I love to train, but this man was unbelievable. Now I'm younger, I'm lighter, and it was easier for me to do certain techniques than him. And after we did like an hour, an hour and a half of training, hitting the bag and everything else, he said, we spar. I said, oh, man. Okay, so I knew that you could throw a kick, you could throw a punch, it's non-contact, and you could score as many points as you want. But I know at one point in time when I get close, bang, I'm going to get nailed because, you say, oh, sorry about that, you know, because maybe <laughs> I'm faster than you. So he set the bar by saying, sorry, this is good. And you, you learn those things as you go along. But he always, always told me, about train hard, learn this, learn that. Then he would come up and say, no, that's wrong. And that will never work. Don't do that. You know? So he was my number one teacher. And remember, I'm a young teenager there. So he's like my father image. No, not my father. I, mean, I had a great dad. He was more a big brother image. And I was the second of a family of six. I have an older sister, so I didn't have a big brother. He was my big brother. And he would show me things, uh, um, how to, to get in with life and everything else. And, and one time I got into trouble, and uh, I swear to God, the other guy started it. I swear to God. And then I went to see my, my instructor, which was Mr. Sylvain. And he would explain life to me. He would explain matters. And remember, he was a police officer. So he was always according to the law. So I had a, a very good brilliant instructor that I owe a lot because he was my good mentor and he did a lot of great things for me. And talk to me about that second sensei of yours at the same time. Ah, my second sensei was uh, something else. My second sensei was from England. His name was Richard Morris. Sulky Richard Morris, who passed away last July. May he rest in peace. He was 84 years old. He was as crazy as they came. <laughs> the movie uh, Arthur with Dudley Moore. Arthur was a rich guy in the mm -hmm. movie, and he was an alcoholic, and he was laughing all the time, and he was always having a good time, and he was smart, and people liked him. It was a little bit the description I could say about Soki Morris, except he was a good jujitsu man, and I've learned a few things with him, but mainly it was in between the ears. It was the spirit. It was the mental side. He was a bit of a psychic and he could, he, he could hypnotize people. He could go to their minds and he would, I would have, if I travel with him, some days I'd have two minutes of very good time. And then it was like squirrel. And then he would run to it and have fun. <laughs> he, he was over the room, but he showed me things that you can't explain on a talk show like this, which is very deep. And I'm not great at this very deep stuff, you know. I know that if you hit me, it's going to hurt, you know, so I better get out of the way. So that's fine. So he, um, he, he was also, his hobby was to be a gardener. He was a great gardener. And one time we're driving, we're in England, we're going to teach a seminar. He stops the car and he says, hurry up, come with me. We jump a fence, we go then, we jump another fence. And he's showing me flowers that are just blooming and how beautiful they are. And I said, damn, we jumped two fences to see this. I mean, I'm not a gardener, right? But that man, I owe a certain part of me as far as the spiritual side 
will be. And, and, he, and he was a funny guy. I got to tell you a funny story about him. He picks me up at Heathrow Airport, and I'm going to spend a week, 10 days with him, and we're going around to teach seminar. And his face is all scratched, and you could tell that the, like it's, there's a, almost blood coming out. You know, and I said, uh, what happened to you, Soki? No, nothing. It's okay. It's okay. Come on. I said, are you okay? Yeah, I am fine. So we go, and I get there. So all the boys show up that night. They come in to have a beer and dinner and talk. I'm in town. You know, it's, they're all, we're all my friends. And I asked him, so what happened to Soki's face? He said, well, we had a big barbecue at his place. And uh, he had a few drinks. And you know that big bush of roses? Yeah, he fell in it. And it fell into some roses with all those. Wow. So he, he was a good guy. And I, I don't want to say he was an alcoholic. He was a man who enjoyed life. He, uh, he had a good soul. Uh, yeah, we, I got, they could do a movie on his life and it'd be funny, you know? So... That was so, the I wouldn't mind connecting you and Sensei Suino on an idea that I'm curious about. Because when I was looking and, and researching you a bit online, I, I saw that he was described, and maybe this, you would find this correct or incorrect, as your Budo Sensei. And I know that that's a word that Sensei Suino features on his actual JMAC website, the idea of a modern day Budo. So what is that for each of you? What, what, what is that path and that Budo? It's not uh, a word we see as much these days. Well, I mean... Budo is more the, the life and the spirit and the kindness and the goodness and what you're going. See, w once you've learned, one time we're going to Europe with the group and I've got about 20, 30 students coming and we're at the airport in Montreal flying to Paris. And the father of one of the girls that's coming with us, he says, oh, so you're going to France to learn how to beat up guys and fight. I said, well, no, not quite, you know. Uh, I, I consider world champions as athletes, and I consider martial artists as martial artists. So the Budo is the life that you bring out of the martial arts. By doing things over and over and over again, you build confidence. You build a lot of flexibility, maybe, but you build your mind, you build your physical, and you build your spiritual. And if you combine all of that together, that's what I call Budo. And that's what I call the Budo spirit. And that's what I call the Budo life. You know, I walk on the, in the dojo, I bow. Why do I bow? It's respect. I get on the mats, I bow. I have a partner, I bow. And I do the same thing when I leave. That starts there, you know. And it starts that how to tie your belt and why you tie your belt a certain way and how you approach the martial arts. To me, that is all what it is about as far as life in martial arts and the Buddha life. Sensei Suino, I'm guessing a fair bit of that resonates with you. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, four or five years ago, a guy named John Ray came and visited my dojo. And John was one of the first guys to be super successful in Iaido in Japan, like I was. He was there a few years before me. And he has a, a dojo in, in Texas. Um, very well-respected guy in the sword community. And he came up to our dojo and he watched for a while and we met him and we talked to him. And then he said, can I have a moment to address your students? And he said, he said, listen guys, um, I really appreciate your attention to your sensei. You're doing the motions that he does. You're paying attention. You're trying to understand how they're done and why they're done. He said, but I want to also urge you to watch everything else. <laughs> how does he walk into the room? Right. Um, how does he walk into the room? How does he bow before he steps on the mat? Uh, how does he address people? What's the look in his eyes? Why are his paws, you know, when, does, when he pauses, why does he pause? And, um, and that's the, that's the um, subtle evidence of Budo, right? Of the experiences that, that uh, Hanchi Terrian was just talking about, that when you stay in this game long enough, it transforms who you are. And uh, folks who are interested in that, I think just need to learn to really pay attention to guys who have been kicking around in this for a few decades. I would say don't that's, that's, that's yep. just, you, know, you know, that's interesting is that uh, I always say about Sensei Legacy, in my view, when I watch him, he's always the best student in the room. Like when his teacher is on the floor, he's always the best student in the room. And one of the things I, I said about myself was I watched him so closely. If he was leaving the dojo and dropped his keys, I would drop mine twice on the way out just to be sure that I was copying what he was doing. <laughs> you just answered my question, Sensei Dofan, because I was going to say I got to learn how to treat 
a sensei by watching how you treated our sensei, but you didn't necessarily have that same, because you didn't get to watch Hanshi with his teacher as much, but you did see him on the floor with, with instructors. Are you so talking that, about me? Yeah, because I got to learn that oh, from I, you. I saw hundreds of hours of uh, Sensei Legacy with Sensei Sandoval. I saw him uh, both in the dojo and in his home and driving in cars. Um, yeah. Uh, I got, I have a very clear image of what it's like to be a great student. So Hanchi Terrian, um, you, you opened your school then in, eight, in 1968, is that correct? 1968, April 1st, that was April Fool's Day, so I fooled everybody, we're still going on. <laughs> and, uh, and just to make it right, it's not a franchise. It's, I have seven schools in the Ottawa area, they're all privately owned now. And it all, all of them are owned by my students, ex-students, no, not ex-students, my students, and they run it. So what I want is to make sure that everything is good because, you know, these guys are so good right now. And I'm in the 2020 club now, you know, 2020 club is 20 pounds too much, 20 years too late. So I left <laughs> them doing all the bulwark and they, and they are doing a, an awesome job, right? And then you become more with those people you became more of a mentor and you became more of a good leader and you let them grow. And they've all grown. They're from eighth degree black belt, seven degree black belt, fifth degree black belt. They're excellent, excellent teachers, but their hearts are in the right place and they are good people. If they don't have that, not interested, you know? And then how did you find that? Oh, yes, Nancy Dauphin. Uh, no, no, you go. But I just I want to get in there with a different different line of questioning at some point. But I don't want to sidetrack this. So go ahead. Real quick, I just wanted to ask how you found the transition from having two senseis to being the sensei. You know that that comes gradually because I opened my school and my first thing I did I went to see Professor Sylvain and I said Professor Sylvain I'd like to open the school because I have students from out of town asking me to train them. One, do I have your permission? And he said, yes. And he said, where are you gonna be teaching? It's about an hour from Ottawa on the outside in a small town called Castleman, Ontario. And it was like a one horse town, you know? So I went there and he came with me and he checked the place out and he said, okay, you'll do fine. You can help son, you come and see me. And I'm still training with him and I'm still helping him with classes. So that gradually spun around from April, and then I think around September 1st, I had to come back in town. I had more people from Ottawa driving there to train than the people from the village. So we trained there, and four months later, I opened at East End in Vanier, and uh, we had a ball, you know? So the transition was made slowly. Always, always respect your instructors, your peers, and everything else. And I'm just going to throw a little sidebar. I saw a photo of Grandmaster Wallace last week or 10 days ago. Skipper Mullins was a great, great champion in karate. And he went to the funeral like many others were there. Jeff Smith, Joe Corley, the whole community in Texas were there. And Bill, I saw a photo of you with a shovel full of dirt that you're throwing on the casket once the casket is down. That to me is the respect of the people that you were brought up with. Because when, when you compete against somebody, you learn something. When you lose, you learn something, you better learn quick, you know? And then with your teacher, you learn. So all of that put together brings up and brings things out of you or brings you to the level that you're gonna become a sensei. And I was before that, I was an assistant instructor at Professor Sylvain School. Then years down the road, I became a Renshi, which is a polished teacher, and I enjoyed that. Wow, what a big promotion, and right up to where I am today. Yeah. That's it. Uh, Sensei Terran, I'm wondering if, um, we talked about this a couple times, a, a few times, and I think you have really clear thoughts and good thoughts on this, is, things that are missing from the younger generations, things that you feel right now that they should really be paying attention to that would help them become not necessarily better physically, like, but 
they would just become better martial artists if they would start to do these particular things that are maybe missing now that were there when you were younger? Well, I, there's, there's a lot missing because the life is different. We'll start with, with calling it the way it is, you know? When I was training, and you go back to the 60s, um, life was different. There was no internet, there was no video games, there was no cell phone. Uh, there was only a few books in martial arts and martial arts was very, very mysterious. And you had superstars in those days. Do you know that the superstars of those days, like Mr. Wallace and Jeff Smith and Chuck Norris are still superstars, but name me three or four that are world renowned from the now generation, there's nobody. That there's very talented kids, but things change. So when you want to have success and you want to go up in the martial arts, well, you need to surround yourself with the best guidance that you can have, with the best knowledge that you can get, and the best encouragement that you can receive. And that comes from your sensei or hanchi or teacher, whatever it is, and that teacher becomes your mentor. Because if I skip the beat when I was training with Mr. Sylvain, he'd let me know. One way or another, he would let me know. And if I drag my butt and I didn't train hard and then we we had a, a club tournament or something like that somebody would hand me my butt on a silver platter and it hurt you know so you get to learn but today the generation are so bloody well surrounded by great teachers and it's the great teachers sometimes that will make the difference for them the, the dojos, I'm looking at your school, look how beautiful that school is. We had a hole in the wall to train. We had a lot of sweat equity. And some, one of my dojos had no windows. So you could see the sweat running down, you know, and I tell the guy, it's okay, I bought a fan. It's, you know, <laughs> like 100 degrees, I put a fan down. Then they go, yeah, yeah, very good. It's, well, that's the budget, you know, so, so it, it was about training. And it was about giving your best. And if you surround yourself with the right people, and in my case, I had Professor Sylvain, that was one, but I had other people that have helped me out. If some business people helped me out in the community. I had somebody I could go to sometimes just to vent. I had somebody else I could go to and say, look, I'm in a rock and a hard place, can you help me out? And you had all of that put together then it starts to work. So the generation today, I think, should search more to get a lot of people surrounding themselves. Mm. When I say the generation today, I'm not talking about the Q-Rats. I'm talking about the black belts, you know? Like you guys have got Anshi Legacy, who's a great leader. And he, he, from everything you told me, from everything I know about this man, he has guided you well, and that's why you are where you are today. But some people are not easy, and they won't take all the, um, all the directions that will be given to you. So there's a little bit of that, I think, that could be improved, not missing, but could be improved, and I think that's our job. You know, I, I go now and I teach a lot of seminars, and I'm training some of the guys, younger guys, to teach a seminar. And this is what I tell them. First of all, they got to have a nice personality. Number two, they have to be good. But the biggest secret of teaching a seminar is make the people happy so that they learn something while they're happy. And I tell them, everybody in your seminar will remember 10% at best of what you've been teaching. 10%. But they will remember 100% of who you are. So if you... Screw up if you start, you have four letter words and you're cursing, don't go. If you got a finger up your nose all the time, don't do that, you know? So they will remember 100% who you are. And it's not permitted to everybody to be great. I can be the best I can be in something and that might be 50% of another person. So you have to respect that. So you keep in mind that people will remember 100% of what, who you are, and maybe when you teach, 10%. Well, so this brings me nicely to, uh, Sensei, do you have a follow-up? Uh, 
No, no, no. I just wanted to say uh, just quickly, Hanchi Terian, that Hanchi Montalvo from one of our previous guests, he has logged in and uh, he just sent me a message and said that Hanchi Terian is an amazing, amazing Hanchi. Very honored to be listening to his words of wisdom. Awesome. I say thank you. And last week I was really, really entertained in the show. So thank you so much. Uh, Grandmaster, thank you. Well, so this leads uh, to our first question. Uh, so from Mike Russell, who's uh, one of our, uh, our teachers and students that are at our school, he says, Sensei, you, you're talking about being a good leader. And we did touch on this a little, but what in your experience can make a good student and a good follower? To be a good student, first of all, you need to have a good teacher. Let's start with that. And you need that teacher you need to follow the rules and regulations. And, and you know, if you walk a very narrow path, you're going to learn and see everything in that path. But if you walk wider and you look to the left and to the right, you're going to see a little bit more. So to become a good leader, it, it, you have to understand that a good leader has nothing to do with the role that you play. It's not about playing a role. It's about the goal that you want to set. So you don't set a role because, hey, look, man, you know, I'm the big boss, you know, like uh, you wash the floors. You know, hey, that, it's not that. It's the goals that you set. And if you set goals, you have to achieve them. And to the students, you know, I, I, I've got students for 52 years, I had all kinds of them. We had world champions. We had people who, who couldn't chew gum and walk down the street at the same time. They were not that coordinated, you know. So you've got a whole bunch of other things, but you have to show them a lot of different steps. And for some people, they need to being applauded the right way because they did, on a scale of 1 to 10, their max 2. And they did, they gave me that night 2. But if another guy, his max is eight out of 10, if he gives me a two, I'm gonna let him know, right? And, and, and I'll just tell you a little anecdote about that. I used to go to Europe, and I still do, but I, was, I, I used to go to Austria for quite a while and I had a lot of students that were following me. So I don't go for about six, seven years, just busy, other things. So three years ago, two years ago, I get, uh, they asked me, they said, look, we have a summer camp it's in the Alps. It's beautiful. And it's that, 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 you want to come. And I said, uh, sure. So my schedule was good. I fly there. They pick me up. They show me around. I sleep in Vienna one night. The next morning, we have a little tour downtown Vienna, which is beautiful, by the way. And then we take a two-hour drive to the camp in the mountain. We get there at five minutes to two. I'm teaching from two to five, and it's hot, my friend. It's really, really a hot day, and we're teaching in the tennis type of arena. It's like a ho hockey arena, but there's two tennis courts, and it's a tin roof, and no AC, and they didn't have a fan like I had in the old school. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they come up, and... and Austrians and German people are, live in a box. They never step out of the box. If they say we start at two, it's not 2.05, it's two o'clock. I had a friend with me from the United States and, and I just run and I said, change here. He said, where do we change? Right here, you know what I mean? Everybody's there, so just turn around, face the, face the board, change, you know what I mean? Crap, you know, so, so we change and at two o'clock sharp I start. They give me a group of about 40, 50 black belts. So I sat them down, and this comes back to what I was saying about the level and how you want to raise it and you want to have fun. And I told them, I said, look, you got two choices, guys. You want to look good or you want to be good. That's your choice. Tell me right now, and we'll, we'll adjust everything. They said, we want to be good. I drove those people for three hours, like really good training. I'm going to say it was a very good class. Thank you for me, you know, but... But I had a great yuki to work with. And after about an hour, I said, look, remove your gi top, put a t-shirt. Because everybody was soaked. So three hours, I mean, grueling three hours. And I think they had like two little short five-minute break for water and whatnot. And then we went. We finished at five. 
And the teacher, the promoter said, tonight at seven o'clock, you have an optional class from seven to 8.30. And I said, well, what is the optional word? What does it mean here in Austria? He says, well, the students can come and train with you for an hour and a half or not, or they can have a night off. I said, okay, great. So we grab a bite to eat. I finish at five, you know, and, and you know, when you do a seminar, you just finish at five, you don't leave. You, you got photos, you got to sign autograph, you, you got to talk to people. So I go and eat, I go back to my room, I change my D, I come back at seven o'clock. Every student that trained for three hours showed up for an extra hour and a half. So go back to your question. It's how you bring them up. It's how you give it to them. But throughout the day, some of them I had to tell them, hey guys, that's not the way this is done. You can give me more. And others, you know they're doing their best and you know they're giving you their best. So high five everybody that deserves it. So uh, I'm going to, in a, after this next question, ask Sensei Dofan to bring us into the 70s, your coaching and that sort of kickboxing heyday. But this does seem like a good question from JJ Gray. Uh, you're talking about the teaching. When learning or teaching a move, what's the mindset, and I'm going to pair add, that you use to try and break down the move and understand it as intricately as possible? You just nailed it. It's breaking down the technique. You know, if you show a judo throw, and you come to the front and you just do the throw, boom, it's okay, go ahead. Uh, that's not gonna work too much. You show somebody a kata and you do the whole kata once or twice and you say, do it, it's not gonna work. So you have to break it down. So my approach, for example, if I'm doing one technique, I let the person grab me in that one technique. I explain the basic situation and the basic escape from that situation and how it should be done. Then I get them to practice one and two. Let's go, guys, one and two. Okay, now that we've got that, grab a partner. Let's apply it, one, and apply it, two. And then I say, now, easily we can do three, four, and five now. So let's do three, bring the person down. Five, we go this way. Uh, four, we go this way. And five, we go that way. And if you break it down, it's going to work. Professor Sylvain said one thing to me many, many years ago. He said, if it takes you more than three minutes to teach one technique, right? Break it down as much as you can because it's not going to, they're going to have trouble to learn it, right? So I break it down, part one, part two, part three. And then I put it all together. And then when, here's something that I do a lot in most seminars. I teach a technique. And it's an escape of something like Japanese jiu-jitsu. You know, it's like basically the same. And then they, they get it. Then I say, okay, stop. Hold the press, everybody. Move to the side. And I say, all right, Sean, you and Randy, demonstrate. You go, really? And everybody's watching. And you just learned it. So you give me your best because your pride is there, right? So boom. But I know you got it. Then it's Randy's turn. And he gets it. Then the whole class starts to apply. How do you feel right now? You feel like a million bucks. You don't feel like a beginner. You don't feel like you've learned something for the first day. You say, I've got black belt attitude, buddy, and I've just proved it. And then you keep training, and I say, stop. And then you get somebody else, and then they do something. I'm not a great kid. I'm not great to teach kids. But I have, for one class, for one class, I'll have a super good time, and they will have a good time, and the parents watching will have a good time, and the teacher will enjoy it, and the kids will look forward to come back to the dojo for several days. So that's all you do. It. The secret, break it down. After you break it down, they train part one, part two, part three. And after that's done, get somebody to demonstrate it and give the candy where it's due. Mm -hmm. You know, this is great. Here's your candy. And go from there. And the students will come back because they're not afraid of you anymore. You know, they just love to be surrounded by you because they're learning and they feel good about it. Yeah. Sensei, you, you, you cool with that? You want to bring us into that heyday? Because it really is one. And I know you're really entrenched in that. You introduced me to the idea of Jean-Yves and that type of kickboxing. And I, I, I'd like to watch this conversation as much as lead it. Yeah. I, I just want to say too, to Hanshi and I really like what you're saying about 
I just wrote it down. Like I've written down a bunch of things because I like to write things down and then think about them later. And uh, I like that you said, I gave high fives to those who deserved it. Yeah. Right. Like that's, that's something very interesting, right? I get, you know, I don't know what you did to the people who didn't deserve it. Like maybe a, like a swift <laughs> kick in the groin or something. But, <laughs> but when, when you say something like that, it always makes me think about, um, you know, people, if you, if you coach to the top level, then people try and rise to that level. But if you spend all your time at the lowest level, then people kind of sink down to that level. But anyway, yeah. that's just a thought. When you um, get to the low level, Sensei, that's where you learn your craft. That's where you learn. You know, if I had to coach Bill Superfoot Wallace and Jean-Yves Terrio, on how to throw a punch. You know what I would say? This is how the class would go. Throw a punch. I don't have to teach it. They know how to do it, right? So you just make sure they stay sharp and they stay motivated. But to learn your craft, to develop students, the low level is the best. And when you work with elite, you really got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. But you got to push them. You got to get them. You got to get the, not so much push them, but get the best out of them. And if you get the best out of them and instill in them for the competitors. Now, we're not... A, we used to be a hardcore competitive school and we love tournaments. I have, and I would tell everybody and say, look, you're going to a tournament and if you're satisfied with a second or third place, you're a loser because first place is the winner. Now I can't say that to the beginners, right? But I can say that to the black belts. And then they say, yeah, I'm fighting tonight. I'm guaranteed second place. I say, don't even fight. Get out of here. Because second place, you're still a loser, you know? And show me a good loser, and I'll show you a loser. You know, it's it, <laughs> your best. I mean, if you give your best and you lose, well, fine. You gave your best. Here, here's another anecdote. It, we, we're in uh, Austria, in Vienna, for a world championship 20 years ago. And I have one girl from Toronto in the black belt kata division. So they all line up, they give their cards, and she comes to see me and she says, Angie, I'm the only Canadian woman black belt in that category. And I looked at her straight in the eyes and I said, how many does it take to win gold? And I walked away. She won gold. And that woman today has three kids, is a great, great athlete. She came to Capital Conquest about four or five years ago with her husband and the three kids. And we're walking back to the hotel. And my wife's with me. And I have told Terry Lynn that, uh, that story. And they're about 20 feet ahead of us. And we're behind. And if you've been to Capital Conquest, there's like an overpass to, to go to the hotel, right? So we're in that overpass. And I just go, hey, sweetheart, how many does it take to win gold? And she raised her hand with one finger. She says, one. She never forgot that, you see? So that is how sometimes you have to play the little mind games with some people and then cheer it there. Now, don't get me wrong. A student gives his best, wins second place or third place. That's good. You know, that is awesome. And you got to start somewhere. And I was never a world champion by far. I was a good coach, but never a world champion. So that's why I stopped competing. I just did a few tournaments. So I stopped competing because I would have been second, third place at best. The odd time may be at first place. Well, I don't, I'm not sure about that. I've seen you, Hanchi, like you're a very skilled martial artist. But uh, um, getting into the kickbox, I just want to mention that uh, Hanchi Legacy's computer has died and he's working on getting himself back in right now. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that I got to say is um, – this is a pretty unique situation where you have a person like uh, Grandmaster Bill Wallace, Hanchi Terrian, Hanchi Legacy. Uh, these people, if, if you're, again, like I said, like I, I don't want to be too forward. If you don't know who these people are, you have a serious problem. You have a serious deficiency in your <laughs> martial arts right now. And you need to get off of this call and go fix that deficiency as soon as possible. But um, these people were around in the infancy of contact karate when it was starting. So like, I know, I know myself that 
Sensei Legacy is one of the very first people to do kickboxing karate here in Canada. Him and Leo Laux in 1971 went down to the Elmwood Casino in Windsor. Uh, it was back when they weren't even, they were wearing like foam, foam dip. I've seen the pictures. They're wearing like foam dip hand gear. Um, it's not even boxing gloves. Like they're just, uh, they're going at it. And these people got the skills and the power. So I guess this might be a question for you, Hanshitarian. And I guess we have, we also have, uh, oh, Sets of Legacy's back. So um, we have Grandmaster uh, Bill Wallace. It would be really interesting to hear Hanshitarian or from you, Hanshi Legacy, or from you, Grandmaster Wallace. How did this evolve? Like, what was the first time that you showed up and people were doing, say, karate, and it wasn't contact karate. And then all of a sudden, how did it evolve into this thing where now we have the UFC? Like, what, what was the path from nothing to where it is now? Like, I, I know Sensei Wallace knows the exact story. I know Sensei Legacy knows that story. And I know Sensei Terry, and you know that story too. So, um, Sensei Terry, maybe let's start with you. It's your night. Like, how do you see that happening from your 60 years? Well, let's go back to when in the 60s. Karate was, first of all, never meant to be a tournament game. It was a one-shot blow, you know, knock the guy out, go home. It was built for self-defense and fighting. It was boogie, you know. Then they put tournaments on. And they had wazari in karate, half a point. Not enough power, speed, whatever it was. And then they had a full point. Then it became really good, good technician and good fighting. And then Taekwondo came in and brought in a little bit of speed with kicking. And then what happened is they went from regular point to semi-contact, which semi-contact to me is like, it's a joke. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, how do you call semi-contact, you know? So semi <laughs> back from Bill Wallace kicking you in the face will knock me out and hurt me real bad. If I, you know what I mean? And that's semi-contact. But I'll tell you, in 1968, I went to June Reese Tournament in Washington, D.C. I saw Joe Lewis, may he rest in peace, fight for the first time. And he fought the first round. And Joe would step in the ring. It was a platform. And he steps in the ring and he would go bang in a horse stance and look straight down. He had the killer look, the killer reputation. He had knuckles that were about a foot high, you know? And he fought with this guy, and I swear to God, the guy threw a punch. Joe grabbed the sleeve, and he threw his famous sidekick in the guy's rib, and both legs went off the ground of that kid. He was a heavyweight, 20 years old, maybe. So Joe wins the fight, of course round two, and that's how everybody was fighting. Fighting, it was hard, it was tough. And then in 1974, Bill Wallace, Jeff Smith, Joe Lewis, and Duenas from Mexico won the first world championship full contact karate in LA that was big and it was on television and it was great fights. And then from there, it developed into the athletes, got better. They went from, you have to understand, they were point fighters. They were tough mothers. And then they went to full contact. And then full contact karate, which we know as kickboxing, showed up. So the footwork had to be different. The training had to be different. And Joe Lewis would always train like a boxer. He would run, he would do rounds, he would, he would do everything. He'd come to Ottawa do a seminar, stay three weeks at my house. We would train together. This guy was unbelievable. But he was also, there was a kid coming up behind him named Bill Superfoot Wallace. And he changed the whole world because he made people believe that with the kick, you could win a fight. You know, so everybody started to train that. I'm going to taste something that that Mr. Wallace told me when he was in Ottawa on November 1st and him and, Wa and Wally Slokey did that fight. I mean, you were there, so it was, it was great to see 74 years old. Like right now, actually, I can't wait to be 74 if that's how good you look at 74. So I'm really looking forward to that. But he came in and he told me he had been 
coming from, I think it was France, and I think they were in Paris, and he's doing an exhibition about. So Mr. Wallace is 73, his birthday is December 1st, and in Ottawa it was November 1st, so 74 with 30 days, right? So in, in France, as he's walking to the ring to do a show, there's a, a, a young boy there, and he says, yeah, my sensei or whatever, this guy's going to knock you out. Well, what do you know? The super foot mentality changes. He knows this guy's going to come after him. And, and, and Bill told me, 18 seconds, got him in the rib cage with a sidekick. And he says, that was including <laughs> the 10 count, you know? And he put him out. So it went from all of that to point fighting to where it is. Now, there's a lot of little slices and episodes in between. And then from there, I think the MMA world came and changed around. But MMA is a new game. It's a tough game. Now the athletes are much better today than they were 10 years ago. And uh, we'll give them credit for that. But the pioneers of this was uh, is those four champions. And you spoke about Wally Slokey in Toronto. Well, Wally Slokey was a very good fighter. And, and he, he, they loved competition. Then you had guys like Rick Joslin. You know, you knew if you fought Wally Slokey and if you fought Ted Martin and then if you fought Rick uh, Rick Joslin, and if you fought Harry Villeneuve, well, man, that was like a year's work in, in one night. And in those days when you went to a tournament, nobody, like today, sometimes they all get a trophy or a medal. In those days, you did not. And to win the average tournament, you had to fight an average of sometimes eight, nine, or ten bouts in one day. So, you learn your craft very well. And you know that after a tournament, you're all smile, you're macho, yeah, it's great. You go back to your room, you're black and blue, you're in pain, you don't say anything. The next day you smile again and you curse all the way home in your car, you know, because you're in pain. But at least you grew, your sport grew, and we had champions. There was very few tournaments, but they were very good tournaments. Some of them were when you'd go to the Battle of Atlanta, that was a big tournament. When the, then the Diamond Nationals was a big tournament. And the U.S. Open was a big tournament. And then uh, George Bruckner from Europe started to bring Canadian, the American team against Europe. And Wally Slokey was an, an American for that trip. You know, you would go on that team. And these guys would fight anybody, anywhere. So the progress, I'm skipping a lot of beats there. And if somebody else want to add something, go for it, you know? Um, do you mind, uh, Hanchi Terrian, if we ask uh, Sensei Wallace? Are you kidding? Do you remember, oh, Sensei yeah. Wallace, I when your first off. time, where you were like, okay, I'm going to have a contact fight. Like, what was that? The first oh, day, you're like, I'm going to have a contact fight today. That's not it. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Say it. That's not it at all. I had uh, won several tournaments, point tournaments in, in, uh, in the United States. Back when I was fighting, it was called Blood and Guts. Uh, if you smacked a guy in the face, caused blood. If he got up, you got a point. If he didn't get up, they gave him five or ten minutes to wake up or to come back. Uh, very seldom did you get disqualified, uh, which I didn't like because I came from a fairly affluent family, and I didn't want to get hurt, and I'd never been in a fight before. All of a sudden, they said, now you get to hit each other. Uh, I said, well, no, it's more fun when I throw a kick and say, I could have killed you. I don't want to have to do it. And then all of a sudden in April, excuse me, March, 1974, uh, a guy named Mike Anderson calls me and he says, Mike, Mike says, Bill, uh, we picked you as our middleweight. You're going to be the middleweight on our team. We're going to go to Europe and fight the Europeans. I said, great. Looking forward to it. What time do we leave? He says, Bill, you don't understand. I said, what don't I understand? He says, it's, it's full contact. I said, what do you mean full contact? He said, it's to the knockout. And I said, well, you guys have fun. Have a blast. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Call me when you get back. And he said, no, no, you got to do it. You got to do it. He says, no, I don't want to do it. Right now, I can have fun doing it. You know, I, like uh, uh, Master Terrian said, you know, you don't get hurt. You might get hit, bruised a little bit, but you don't get the crap knocked out of you. And I said, no, no, I don't want to do it. And people don't realize this, but Joe Lewis was my, was my uh, senior in Okinawa. I studied in, in Naha City, which is uh, uh, Eizo Shimabuku, which is uh, Shobayashi Shorinru. Well, Joe Lewis was there a year and a half before me. So he's my senior. 
So he gets on the phone. He says, Bill, you're going to do it. I say, oh, come on. I don't want to do it. I, uh, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. So, he's, so he talked me into it. And uh, it was a blast. But back then, we wore the foam, foam equipment. The first uh, three fights I had, we wore the foam equipment. So you could grab, you could throw, you could sweep, you could take down, you do all these things. It was on a platform. So uh, it was fun trying to knock guys off the platform with a side kick or a spinning kick or something like this. But uh, uh, it became a blast. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the hell out of it. Just all of a sudden, hey, I can hit somebody now. And I was pretty good at defense, so I didn't get hit that much. That's why career lasted long, I guess. But uh, it was it was like, you know, Grandma, Grandma turns and just, you know, just we go out there and, and it, first of all, it's like a, a, a bunch of people thrown together. Then all of a sudden it got better and better and better. When we first fighting, we were just experimenting. Now you look at the UFC, you look at the kickboxing where Johnny Carrier was fighting. He was absolutely fantastic. I mean, just, just the, the punching techniques, the kicking combinations that he had, uh, phenomenal. And then now you look at the UFC stuff with the, the training and the endurance and the, the techniques that they use, it's phenomenal. So one thing I just want to say to the people thank watching. So yep. I just want to say thank you so much to Sensei Wallace for that. Um, and sorry, Sean, I don't want to cut you off, but – I know we got to get back to Hanshitarian, but I want to put Sensei Legacy on the spot just a little bit right now because he's kind of the trifecta of the people on this call. And I know there was a day when he was doing karate fighting, and then there was one day when somebody said, hey, put this stuff on and get in this boxing ring in Windsor and Elmwood Casino and uh, mix it up with these people. And I, I wonder, Hanshi, um, you know, what was the feeling like before you stepped in the ring on that day? Like, what, did you know it was going to happen before you showed up that you were going to have to do kickboxing or with foam dip gear on, Hanchi Legacy? Or, and how were you feeling going into it? Well, it's quite different when you're going there and you know that the purpose for the other person is they're going to try to knock you out, right? So um, that was the main thing. But I think it even upped my game a little bit, just maybe out of fear or not wanting to be the guy that that took that hit. And the other, but the other thing I'd like to say about the other subject that uh, you were talking about before was I, I sort of like it because it you you always has had this thing in the past where persons would say, "Well, my style is better than yours. My teacher can beat yours." <laughs> there is now there is now an arena where you can go in and and prove that. So it sort of sort of pushes all the big talk aside. I like that. I like that too, Sensei. I love that. So sorry, Sean, I, I cut you off there, Benz, but uh, where well, are you gonna go? Where I wanted to say something and then ask a question. The one thing I wanted to say, and we've had a lot of masters on here. And one of the things to the people watching and maybe people who are lower ranks, you know, when I started martial arts, I thought that fear was something I wasn't allowed to have. And we hear the word, like we hear real masters say, I was afraid. And I like that because I personally still feel that vibration sometimes. And also to hear uh, Grandmaster Wallace mention, you know, I came from a nice family too, a well-to-do family. And I sometimes was like, fuck, I'm not tough enough because I didn't come from the streets. And again, it's nice to hear that it, you know, if you're watching and you're a green belt and you're worried that you needed a different background or you need less fear, I just think it's nice to know you don't. Hanchi, Terry, and I wanted to ask you just quickly, you know, you talked about those days in the 60s working with Sylvain, uh, Sensei Sylvain, and you're doing jujitsu, but at the same time, you're punching and kicking. You're obviously doing the throws. It almost seems like back in the day you were doing MMA and then somehow it got lost for a while. And then we've come back around uh, as of 1993 to MMA. Is that wrong or is that? It, it, in some ways it's right, but in some other ways it's not. It's like Mr. Sylvain, who had a judo background, a karate background, and jiu-jitsu, implemented punching, kicking, and then kickboxing, uh, not kickboxing, but then sparring. And then we would fight in karate tournament and we would do sparring. Mm. And then at some point, you know, you start to mess around in the dojo and you fight and then you bring the guy down. And he said, no, this is not the place and the time for it. And then at some point, 
I think he saw something in there. And then he started to put something together where you did punch, kick, and bring the person down. It was not for points. It was for fighting, right? So maybe, maybe it had a little bit of direction towards MMA, but not that much because it was more Japanese style of jiu-jitsu plus punching, kicking, and sparring, you know, and which is still in Japanese jiu-jitsu today. So, yeah. So we got a question from Neil Prime. Hi, Neil. I don't know you, but thanks for the question. I believe the fighters of the blood and guts era could stand up to the fighters today in the UFC because of their experience. Do you agree the experience would able to be able to beat the conditioning of today's fighters? Well, I was not a fighter, so you're not asking the right person for me. I was a, uh, I did three tournaments, first place, mm. second place, and the third place. And I, there was something missing in me to fight. You know, I had, I had uh, all the skills, but there was a little something in my mind about how to make it to the next level. So that was not me. But maybe you can ask Superfoot Wallace that question because he is the man of all times, him and Joe Lewis and Jeff Smith were the best three bar none. And then the next generation, Jaive Terrio came up. But uh, I, I could speak about Jaive with MMA, but not about the legends of those days. Right? That would be a great question for Mr. Wallace, if you want. Well, if, go ahead. I, I heard, uh, back in the old days, we had you know maybe maybe five or six tournaments a year that we would all get together. We had the United States Karate Association Grand Nationals. We had the uh, US, US Championships from Dallas, Texas. We had the uh, internationals out in Long Beach, California, uh, and several tournaments in the Midwest where I was living. And you know, you, you, you meet the same guys over and over and over a lot of times. So you would, you would try to come up with something different that you could compete with and, and maybe do better than ever catch them. Uh, in point tournaments, I think everybody will agree with me. If the referee doesn't want you to win, you're not going to win. So, you know, no matter what happens, they don't have to call your points. They can say, well, it slid off or you didn't have enough contact or it was short or something like this. So, you know, you had to somehow change your strategy, change your fighting abilities so you could, you could eke out that win, you might say. But, uh, we were allowed throws. We could do throws. We, in, in Texas, come the blood and guts here, you could throw the guy, you could stomp the guy, you could kick the guy's legs out from underneath him and, and basically break his nose. Uh, Jim Harrison had his nose broken at the, at the U.S. championships, and they set it with two pencils. And uh, Billy Watson got, it, got, split, got, it, got his eye split at the U.S. championships, and they sewed it up in the middle of the ring. So you go, okay, is this fun or is this fun? And uh, so but, you know, <laughs> when, we, when we put the gloves on, the safety equipment, it was not designed to make contact at the first. It was designed to, to help you both, that you didn't hurt your knuckles or you didn't split the guy's face wide open with your knuckles. Then we started the contact era to see if somebody could take it. And a lot of guys that were really, 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 really good point fighters couldn't take some shots. You know, they were good fighters, but they couldn't take the shot. They couldn't get hit. So, so they, 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 they kept to the point fighting area. But, you know, some of us, I think a lot of us, because of my wrestling background, I have a very strong neck, so I could take a shot. And uh, I didn't want to because it hurts. But uh, uh, it comes to where you just pretty soon you say, well, hell, here it goes. Thanks. Um, a question uh, for you, Sensei Terry, and um, from Christopher. He's asking if you can discuss an event in Detroit where the opening act for Jean Yves Terry was breaking glass in the ring. <laughs> I don't even fucking know why someone would do that. But do you want to chat about that, or you don't have to? It's up to you. Well, you know what? I, I may not have seen the opening act, because we might have been in the back room warming up. But but you got to remember that we we've been. Uh, We've been like a little bit like the, the second generation, right? Like, you know, in the days of the first generations, people had to bring people to the arena, right? And, uh, and at the Joe Lewis Arena in Detroit, well, they, it was the same thing. They had a big tournament. And Jaiv, I think that's the fight that Jaiv knocked the guy out in 20 seconds or something like that. And uh, that's, that's most of the fight. Isn't it, Hanchi? 
That's most of the fights, isn't it? Yeah, you yeah, got to yeah. narrow it down. Yeah. <laughs> this time they said, oh, we don't pay you because you, you knocked the guy out in, uh, in, in 20 seconds, too short. <laughs> I said, well, well, no, no, it's not how the game works, right? <laughs> So um, I, I don't remember the glass breaking, but I'm not surprised, you know, because there was all kinds of show. One event in Montreal, this guy's going to come and break some ice. Ice. He's got these big chunk of ice. And this guy's good. And he walks in with a tiger on a chain. And I'm going, oh, man, just don't, don't let that cat out of there, you know. So, uh, so we've seen everything. And then... <laughs> You know, it got really professional. Um, I was one of the judges at Superfoot Wallace retirement fight in Anderson, Indiana against Bob Biggs. I was one of the three judges. 18,000 people to see that fight. 18,000. So we went from glass breaking, then fighting, to a superstar level and 18,000 people in the arena. It's, uh, I think that the sport started to grow and the sport grew very well. And I think what happened is there was a lull. When all the top guys sort of retired, there was a, a void. And, and then they took that void. Not trying to, it just happened. And then they took that void and then everything grew, yeah. So I got a question for you and for Sensei Suino. So you, you're both masters of Japanese jiu-jitsu. And in 1993, and I agree with you, because I'm in that sort of era that looked at that first and second era as a heyday, but it wasn't my actual time period. I was looking back at it. And then the, uh, the UFC is more my time period. So 1993, that first one shows up, and jiu-jitsu, granted Brazilian, shows itself as being this essential tool now. If you want to be a top to bottom fighter. Did you guys cheer? Did you go, fuck, we knew this all along? Did no. you care? Was there any, did it register? No, it didn't register because I was not in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Right. But I was glad that the name Jiu Jitsu was on top. You know what I mean? Like I have schools, right? When Bruce Lee came out in the seventies, all the schools, not all, but a lot of the schools was karate slash Kung Fu or Jiu Jitsu slash Kung Fu because Overnight, when Enter the Dragon came out, all the schools got packed. But somewhere down the line, in 30 days, it all died out and all the schools, the fake ones, closed, right? So when you see you have a school and you're, you've got jiu-jitsu and the winner of the MMA, uh, UFC, if you want to, at the beginning, was a jiu-jitsu guy, it, it, I'm going to be honest with you, we didn't say, yeah, but it did help, you know, and people were coming in because that's what it was, you know, so... Uh, no, there was a little bit of help there, and, uh, and we thank, we, but you know, you have to understand that UFC was tailor-made for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to win, bar none, and I'm, they're smart, so I give them credit for that, so they knew that they were going to win, but I'm not saying Horse Gracie was not good, don't get me wrong, but it was new, and then the element of surprise, but people watch, and people train, then they watch again, and people train, and then they watch again. And, and you always have to reinvent yourself according to what's happening. Like Bill Superfoot Wallace has a left leg that was clocked at 60 miles an hour. But what people do not realize, I've seen that a long time ago. He's got a left hook that is potent and it's so bloody powerful that he is just going to hit you and you'll wake up Sunday morning to go to church. And it's, it's as simple as that. Because he had to modify himself. <laughs> Foot. He still had that left leg, but he needed that left hand when they're good in close, you know. And when he fought uh, the exhibition fight with Wally Sloty, Wally told me right at the beginning, you know, those who were there, super foot comes in the ring, side splits in the ring, they start and they get close. And what did super foot do? Left hook to the body, left hook to the face. Not hard, but enough to tell them that I'm the boss here, right? Yeah. These guys are dinosaurs, they're tough guys, they're they're heroes and they're pioneers, so they had a good time. So you had to, yes, to answer the question, thank you for them winning. It did help the schools, but it, it helped everything to grow from them. Sensei Suino, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I've seen the same thing, the cycles of, of who gets popular. You know, um, when Bruce Lee came up, the school started, you know, when, when Chuck Norris hit his heyday, uh, when the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu came up. I know on that UFC one, 
the one thing I did like about that was these guys are wearing judo geese, right? So as a judo guy, I'm like, you know, finally we're getting some representation in mainstream martial arts. So agreed, they weren't doing judo, but at least they were wearing judo geese. So it was a step in the right direction. Hey, well said. Um, Hanchitarian, um, insanely, we, we are nearing the end. If everybody wants to chat for a few minutes longer, that'd be lovely. But I got my 10 questions that we ask every guest we have. And you can think about these as much or as little as you like, but we tend to like the first thing that comes to your mind to be your answer. You ready? Ready. What's the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? I'll say there's two. With the kick, it's a shin kick. It's this much off the ground. You hit with the side of the foot. You never see it. You never train for competition with that. But I'm going to hurt you real bad if I kick you in the shin. It's like hitting the coffee table. But my best one is in the great word of Muhammad Ali, there's nothing more beautiful than a right hand when it lands, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the most influential martial artist in your life? Well, Mr. Sylvain, because I was a young man and then he, he, he got me going. But, but through that, you know, I think that you, you also learn from a lot of different people and you also get to know from your students. You learn from your students by them doing certain things. You watch and say, oh my God, this was good, but you don't say it, you just swallow it. But I would say Mr. George Sylvain. Who do you believe is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Bruce Lee, he, he, he changed, uh, uh, he opened up, not with fighting, not with training fighters, with philosophy with how to train and what would work, what would not work, and this and that, you know. And uh, one time I, I asked Joe Lewis that because he trained with Bruce Lee, and I said, tell me about Bruce Lee. He said he was for real. He was definitely for real. Bob Wall told me the same thing a couple of years ago in Ottawa when he came up. So definitely Bruce Lee had a huge impact on all the industry of the martial arts. I'm going to cheat on my own set of questions because I'm going to combine my question with Carl Preslin's. Mine is what excites you most about the next five years of your training? And Carl wants to know what your vision for Capital Conquest is for the next 10 years. Well, to answer your first question, I think, I, I hope I'm alive in five years and I hope that I'm there. So my plan in five years is right now we are starting with the, the new generation they are so damn good, you know. When I was a kid and I was a brown belt or a black belt in the 60s and, and I had being very good, right? But all those dreams, if you get my best dream about being fantastic, the now generation has surpassed that technically, okay? For techniques and, uh, and physical training, they've surpassed that. So in five years, I want to see where they are because they're going to have to carry the following generation. I think our generation, like Anchi Legacy, myself, uh, Mr. Wallace, uh, everybody, even Nick was, was right following behind us, you know. So when you see everybody else that we have brought together, I want to see them where they're going to be. And you know what? If my calculations are right, we are in for a treat. We are in for a a big, big treat. And those are guys like you, Randy. That's the age group, and that's the one we're going to follow. Now, Capital Conquest. Carl, by the way, is from BC. He's a great black belt. He trained in Ottawa. He's training in BC. And then and, and, uh, Sensei Nick, he, he, I think he's also doing Yaido. I saw his wife training Yaido on Facebook. Great guy, super, super nice person. Capital Conquest, November 6, 7, 8. It's locked in. Um, I have to wait to see what the pandemic is going to be all about. But I have plan A, plan B, plan C, right? Plan C would be, and I don't want to do virtual. We just finished a convention, a virtual martial arts convention. It hit in 60 countries. It killed me because it took six weeks of 12 to 16 hours a day, almost every day. But we, we did something that is historical. It was a first. At Capital Conquest this year, I always bring some of the best teachers. And I, I just hope that Grandmaster Bill Wallace will be available to come back this year. And he won't have to fight anybody to get paid. You know, <laughs> he'll just go and teach. 
and spend two days teaching and his lovely wife, Jane. Wait till you meet Jane. You think uh, Superfoot is something? She is a woman that is unbelievable. So, so much fun and pleasant to be with. So, so we're going to bring all the best people to come over. But we have, uh, just for Carl, Carl, reserve November 6, 7, and 8, and I'll give you all the news in August, roughly, if what's going to happen. I'm going to cheat again. I'm going to paraphrase Justin Shea's question. You're working 12 to 16 hour days. Yeah. Why? You could just retire. So many masters at your, at your no. station in life would be like, I'm good. I, I, got, I got some shit on the wall. No, I, I, uh, retirement is not for me. You just readapt. Remember, you have to tune yourself according to the situation. Uh, the reason I do 12 to 16 hours a day is because I have to do it. Because I want to leave behind something. I want to create something for the martial arts. And sometimes, you know, you, it, when you get to be in my position, and it's the same thing for Ancient Legacy, like behind me is a wall. You know, I travel with 10 guys, that, and they are fantastic. And everybody's teaching, and everybody's applauding, and they're all in front, take a step, show a bow, you know, pose for the photo, sign the autograph. There is one problem. I look to my right, gone. And I look to my left, my gone. So they leave me to do the, the problems. Like It's like you're never born to be a leader. You're, what you do in life, it's like it, it, it's going to come and get you and then you fix it. So I love what I do. And I know I'm still, a, I, 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 I don't want to say I'm still, but I love to teach. And to me, that's great. But I love to create things. I think that I've excelled over the years from a good teacher to a good coach, to a good manager, to a great promoter. And when I call somebody, I say, look, we're having this, you wanna come, I'm doing the event. And if they're available, they come. Because they know it's gonna be a fantastic weekend, a fantastic event. So I still have to be there. There's things we're not finished yet. Like my next big, big move, and this is gonna take a lot of 12 hour days, is going to be the World Kabuto Television. And this is going to be in two years, I'm hoping, in 100 countries where we can teach everybody from that, but teach them not just martial arts, the Budo spirit. Teach them also what life is all about. And we're going to go from there. So no way I'm retiring, guys, unless my health is not good. This echoes something uh, Sensei Adet Rice said, where being great at business can help your martial arts be great. It's not either or. And I'm hearing that from you. But, but for me, it's not business. For me, it's contributing. And if, if you come to my house and you spend the weekend with me, you're not going to sleep on the floor. I'm not going to give you a hot dog uh, three times a day. You're my guest. So when I do a martial arts event and I invite you to come over, well, you're my guest. And when I invite my peers or people above me, well, I have to treat them nice because they deserve it. And they've walked the same journey as I did, right? And we had the hot dogs days and everything else. So now it's time to say thank you and honor them. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? First of all, welcome. And secondly, hurry up your teaching on mat number three in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, either now or in your uh, young man prime, who would you want to fight most and why? Nobody. It hurts like hell when you want to stop, guys. I've had a chance to spar with some people, and, and many of my students became so much better than me, right? And then you would train, and uh, no, but not so much sparring and then fighting for the sake of fighting, you know? When you train with somebody that's from another level, you learn something. And you're going to take the bad shots with the good shots, okay? But if you go there, and remember that story about Mr. Wallace in France, 18 seconds, he knocked the guy out? That was an attitude adjuster, you know? So if you come in with the right attitude, you can spar. You can learn. But if you come in for something, so, so to spar, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, these guys are so good. I could name 25 of them, and they're all in another league better than me. What's the greatest benefit you've gotten from your martial arts that you wish everyone in the world could get? Friendship. 
I had good help, friendship, and friendship around the world. You know what? I go do a seminar and people in martial arts treat you well. You know, I, I've never had a bad experience. Well, I never had a really bad experience, you know, in my life. I had a couple of attitude adjusters, but that was simple. But it's, it's friendship. And, and when you know that you've got friendship, and I'm going to tell you that I, along with many other teachers, have made a difference in the lives of many people. So if you combine that, it's one hell of a ride, my friend, and martial arts did that for me. So it, martial arts was the vehicle for me to do good with people, for the community, of all the awards I've had. One that I, well, one that I am so proud of was Community Builder Award from the mayor. And there's one a year, and to me that was a big one because you give back to your community. It's a bit of the answer to the last question. Greatest achievement, greatest regret. There you go. So, uh, yeah. So, so greatest achievement, well, it, 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 it's, it's, I look at all the students that I had. You know, I counted one day the first and second lineage from my school, right? So there was over 150 schools around the world that opened up because of me. If I would have been a piano player, I would have been a lousy piano player, and I would not have left a mark in the world. But because of who I am, what I did, many of them are still passing forward that martial arts, black belt attitude, that Budo spirit, because they've learned it. And one day, I hope to be very old, because I promise, Bill Superfoot Wallace, a rematch with Sloty in 20 years. So I'm going to promote that. It'll be four. And I'm going to be up in the bleachers. And my friend, uh, Angie Legacy, and I are going to have a cold beer and watch them. We'll help them in the ring. It'll be fine. Greatest regret. Greatest regret. I, I'm, I'm not sure I have any greatest regret. I regret a few things. Sometimes, you know, you, you can be stupid, say the wrong word. You know, that has happened to me and to everybody because I always did my best. I always strive to be the best I can be. And I can't do more than that. I've given literally my shirt to some people. I've, I, I've helped the community. Um, I have two sons that are so proud of, right? And one of them has uh, no children, cannot have children. His brother has six kids from eight to 18, all super nice kids, athletes. They got everything. So now it's coming back. There's no regret, but the good Lord is giving me that love in my heart from my two sons, their wives, and my grandkids. So to have regrets, no, my, my grandfather lived to be 101. And he said he only had one regret. He should have had more whiskey when it was five cents a glass, you know. So, but personally, I have no regrets. Um, we're going to go around the horn and wind it down. That's how we tend to do this. Uh, I'm going to start and say simply that, you know, when I came to the Capital Conquest and the Black Belt Hall of Fame induction ceremony for Hanchi Legacy, I went for fun to hang out with Sensei Dauphin and support and hang out with Hanchi Legacy. I feel like I got away with something because what I got from it was more than I gave because I had this renewed depth of appreciation for the martial arts. And I know that that's what you're trying to do, but I left there thinking, wow, I always knew I was going to do this for the rest of my life, but now I feel like I kind of know why. And it was the gratitude that all of the martial artists older than me that you brought together for that event. The word I just kept hearing was gratitude, gratitude. So I'm very grateful for you tonight. Um, and for you as well, Grandmaster Wallace and the Hanshi Legacy always, um, and, and to my two sensei, Sensei Dauphin, Sensei Suino. Um, but I just want to thank you for taking this time with us. And I want to thank you for, for being that guy who, who, who values community above all else and then creates it for a guy like me who, you know, needs to be reminded sometimes of what the center of this is. Um, sensei Suino. I, I'm a broken record at this stage of these conversations because I think I'm the same thing. I'm going to say it again. We need to get you back. Um, we, I've, got, I've got a ton more questions. Um, you know, we had a conversation with um, Hanchi Legacy. I didn't shut up about it for a week. Uh, everybody in my world was, was sick of it. Um, 
this conversation has been great. I can't wait. We're going to talk Bill Superfoot Wallace into joining us one of these days. Um, this is amazing. I've been involved in the martial arts since 1968, and um, I've never felt this sense of community like I have since we started these conversations. I can't wait to see where this goes. And uh, Hunch Terrian, I can't wait till we get you back here. This is going to be so much fun. I enjoyed myself tonight. It was good. Thank you, sir. Randy. Yeah. I'm a bit like, oddly, I'm a bit speechless and stunned. Um, uh, I think about the people, like I'm looking at all these names on this call, like Hanchi Montalvo, Adet Rice, and we have Bill Superfoot Wallace, and Nick Sweeno, and my teacher, Hanchi Legacy, and Hanchi Terrian. Uh, you know, Sean said grateful. Um, I, I can't believe the life that I'm living. Like I, uh, Sensei Legacy said this to me before. I remember him saying it many times. Um, my life has been a great life. I've had an amazing uh, roller coaster. I wouldn't change anything. I'm so happy for the life that I'm living. And it's because of all these people on this call and the stuff that we're doing. So, you know, this idea about doing this, like having these people together, because was spurred from so many times I just sat in the backseat of Sensor Legacy's call where he and somebody like Sensitarian would be riding along and I would just sit in the back seat quietly and not say anything or get to sit in the room and I would get to hear all kinds of information. And it informed my martial arts to such a high degree that, um, and so I'm really pleased that we're able to do this. Um, Hanchitarian, I just gotta say, this has been, this keeps getting better and better. Uh, you're an amazing man. And I am so happy to have had the chance to, to listen to you. I, I'm, I'm going to be bold and say I'm so happy to call you my friend right now. And uh, I, I really look forward to being able to learn a lot more from you and talk to you and have way more conversations as we move forward. And again, uh, since Wallace, thank you so much for being on. Uh, December 1, I'm December 3rd, Sagittarians, Sagittarius. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, uh, Sensei Wallace, if you're not aware, you might be or you might not, but Sensei Legacy is a great Shoranru practitioner. I love Shoranru. Sean Benson loves Shoranru. <laughs> we're Shorin all around in this joint. Like, we're yeah. all up in Shoranru. Straight up. <laughs> Straight up Shorin. Um, Hanchi Legacy, you got any thoughts you want to share with us? Take us home, part of the chat. Well, the one thing I would like to say, I keep uh, looking at uh, Bill Wallace. I was wondering if you remembered our conversation at the Black Belt Hall of Fame where I, I mentioned that I was the referee when you fought Danielle Richet. Uh, do, you do you remember that? I and do. And I, taught, and I said, don't forget, I don't want you to forget my name, it's Legacy. And you said, I won't forget it. So I, I just want to know if you remembered. I do, I do. <laughs> All right. It was, it was about 12.30 at night. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that makes my day. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. All right, Grandmaster yeah. Wallace, you want to say anything before we give the last word to Hanchi Terrian? Well, my, my wife is, it says you're going to do this with Jacques Terrian tonight. And I said, fine, because we've been friends a long time. And, you know, we are blessed because we're all in the martial arts and we, and this, we, we picked this as our livelihood. And, uh, People said, don't you get bored talking about it? I say, no, because we do. We, this is our life, so we talk about it. And we'll, we'll exchange stories. You know, sometimes we'll, 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 we'll expound things a little bit too much and, and blow them out of proportion. But, hey, that's the fun of it. And I had a blast. Thank you very much for having me, John. You're welcome, my friend. And, and to all my friends that have schools in Canada and, and Sensei Nick, you're in Michigan, you guys got to organize a tour for Grandmaster Wallace to come and do seminars. You know, like he's at your school one day and then a day or two later, another school. I can help you with that. I do that very well. And I'll tell you why, and I'm not selling my friend here. It's just selling the character, the knowledge and everything else. And, uh, and like I said, it, it, when you're booked, you have to be there when you're booked. So I just booked three, four weeks ago, I booked Grandmaster Wallace 
to fight a rematch with Wally Smokey in 20 years. So he's booked for 20 years, but in between 19 and in, in between 2020 and 2040, I think you guys should have him up at your part of Canada and Southern Ontario. And I will maybe bring him to Toronto and Ottawa and Montreal because I just love the man. Everybody's going to win. And Jane and my wife are going to go out shopping. So don't forget your credit card. My <laughs> we'll book them in as long as you promise you're going to teach too, because that would be, that would be the amazing uh, thing. If we could have Bill Superfoot Wallace and yourself, Hanshi John Terry and both teaching, that would be amazing. Everything's possible. We can make it all happen. Hanshitarian, this has been incredible. You know, I talk about this always as the lowest ranking guy in this room always. I feel like I'm just lucky to be along for the ride. And my career lets me kind of be the center of it all. But in reality, I'm really just a kid listening. Um, Sensei Dofan, do we have our times nailed down for our next three guests? Or should we just let everybody know to stay tuned? No, we definitely do. So uh, Sensei Conroy Copeland, we're going to take a week off next Thursday. We're not going to have... Uh, uh, a show. Um, I don't know how I feel about that after tonight. I feel like I want to have one tomorrow. But uh, and then the Thursday after that, we're going to have a Sensei Conroy Copeland uh, on on the show. And then the Thursday after that, we're going to have a great friend of Legacy Shuranru is uh, Kyoshi James Freeze, uh, seventh then He's one of Hanchi Carlos Montavo's uh, students and a good friend of mine in Adets. And then the Thursday after that. We're going to have Hanchi Legacy back, and we're going to be chatting about um, his introduction to White Crane, how he got into White Crane, and we're also going to probably be talking about this, which is Hanchi Legacy's book, which is going to be coming out really, really soon. If we could just get past this damn pandemic, then uh, we, could get this, we could get this book, which is 100% written, printed. I just need my printers to print the damn book, so... Um, those are the people we're having next and we have them out uh, Hanchitarian definitely want to have you back again again we want you to be one of the cornerstones of this because we know you have months worth of information uh, Grandmaster Wallace I, I don't want to put you on the spot but obviously we'd love to talk to you as many times as, as you have time for us to chat and it would benefit everybody in this community if you did want to thank you thank you very much we'll do it Time. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And so uh, Robert just threw up June 18th, June 25th, July 2nd. Thank you, Sensei Dofan, for being so clear on that. Um, what a treat. And by the way, real quick thing, when I alluded to my, my sensei's, uh, Sensei Dofan, Sensei Suino, Sensei Legacy is my first and will be my sensei always. I just, to me, that's important in the martial arts to recognize that. I didn't phrase that right earlier. So everybody... I'm just vibrating from this. I know Sensei Dovans. I know Sensei Suino is. We're all going to break it down later. What a treat. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for tuning in. The viewership keeps growing. The views on YouTube keep growing. And it matters. I mean, none of us are getting paid for this. It matters because of all of this stuff Hanshi Terian was talking about. This community just keeps growing. And the one thing I love, and I've talked about this in other episodes, is that I feel like we're in a heyday of martial arts doing this where it's not fuck that school. It's, it's, Hey, what's that school? Let's see what we can offer one another. And I, as a guy who wants to learn as much as possible from the martial arts in this life, I'm really happy about that. So I just want to say thank you, everybody. We love that you're watching this show. We love creating it for you. And in basically two weeks, we'll see you for the next one. Enjoy your week off. Please be safe. Please be safe. And please love one another. It's a crazy world out there right now. Offer all the love, all the safety you can as someone who's got this Budo spirit. Rock and roll. Thanks Rock and roll. Everybody. Bye, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, John, see you soon. You bet, and go abs, go very soon. We, oui, we, oui, yeah. Go abs, go, go abs, go. <laughs> Take care, guys. Salut. Good night. Salut, Thank you for having me.